Today we're going to do a lube oil and filter on my 1963 Triumph Sport 6, which is uh, basically an Americanized Vitez, but in the United States it's not quite as fancy as the Vitez's, but this one when I restored it, I didn't put it quite to stock, so you'll see that as we go. So here is the engine. This is originally had a 1.6 liter six cylinder, but this is a two liter motor out of a GT6. Also has a TR6 distributor, so it has a mechanical tack drive. Um, it's a Delco Remy alternator. It's a Dan Masters wiring kit with spade type fuses and um, relays and all that. There's also a TR6 intake manifold with a pair of H6S carburetors, which actually I think came off of a Volvo. We added an oil felt, oil cooler, and an electric fan. The radiator has been rebuilt with dimple core for additional cooling. Coney front shocks, and also has a later TR6 cam and a stainless steel header. Stainless steel exhaust we'll look at in a minute. And I think that's about it for the upgrades. Oh, it has a gear reduction starter. We'll get started with draining the oil. This is uh, one of the specialty wrenches that the major suppliers sell. It's got the uh, square drive for the oil plug on one end and the other smaller square drive for the uh, rear brake adjusters. So we just need to take out the uh, oil drain plug. On the side of the oil pan. Get this thing lined up so we don't get oil all over the place. There we go. Well, it was really handy to put one of these little magnetic trays, this lever, right on the drain can. very handy. So while that's draining, let's take a look at the rest of the underside here. Well, there's a better look at the Coney shocks. Uh, this comes from the factory with a sway bar in the front. Here are the uh, stainless steel headers. It's a two-piece header up on the motor, so it's three or six into two and then into one, and there's a large bore pipe coming through, the muffler, and then it splits again here, this is all stainless, and dual rear pipes. You can also see that there is a, a rear sway bar on this car, which is, um, yeah, cause we got it from J.C. Whitney, I think. But it's a uh, Harold Vitez, GT6, I think. This rear pumpkin is actually out of a later model Spitfire 1500. So this car originally had 410 gears. This is now a 389 gear set. And it's also stronger because this engine, the original motor made about 60 horse. This one makes about 120. And we also have an overdrive transmission. It's kind of hard to see. Um, this solid rear transmission mount is just something that I made because this car originally just had a four speed in it. But there's a whole set of videos on rebuilding that transmission because I just did it recently. Um, what else did we do? We had to patch the floors. This car sat out in the desert for a long time. I also had to make this is the spare tire uh, carrier in the trunk. So this is a piece that we made up uh, with a wooden form to bend this edge. This piece is welded onto that. And then with the uh, Harper Freight bead roller to put these marks in it. it do a super fancy job because, hey, unless you're running here on the lift, you can't really tell. It also has SPACs, rear shocks, adjustable. 
and we have TR8 wheels on here with 185, 70, 13 tires, which are really pretty nice. These are Achilles Platinums. Really happy. I've got several sets on different cars. There's the stainless steel mufflers. The, um, the original bumpers that have been just, uh, they're originally anodized, but these are now powder coated. I'm afraid this car is a bit dirty right now, but it'll live. And the springs and stuff are all just stock. They're the original springs. Actually, these cars are really pretty stiff anyway. So I just figured use the old springs, it would be not as quite as be a little softer to ride. We also got halogen headlight conversions. So I did quite a bit to this car one way or another. I just sort of when I put it back together I just sort of thought what would Triumph be doing if they were building it today to some degree. That looks like that's pretty well drained down so we'll go ahead and put the plug back in. This is a magnetic drain plug. You can see there's not really much on it. This, this car's only got about 3,000 miles on it since I, since I restored it. Everything's a bit tight. I mean, the car was originally designed for a four-cylinder engine, so putting a six-cylinder engine in it made everything a bit tight. It's right up against, you know, the radiator's right up against the back of the grill. The motor's tight to the radiator. In fact, the motor's pretty close to the bulkhead. more difficult to access things than it is on the Herald, but it's also a lot more power and it makes a huge difference. This car will do cruise along at 80, 90 miles an hour all day and Herald sounds like it's going to beat itself to death at 75, so I'm quite happy with that. So while we're down here, I should adjust the rear brake. Oh, hopefully. You can see that adjuster there, it's the little square drive, so that basically the adjuster looks like a big flathead sheet metal screw, but the surface where you would normally see the slot has a series of flats radiating out, radiating out from the center. So as you turn it, it pushes a pair of wedges out left and right from here, and you can feel it because it gets tight and then loose. Uh, as you go. So you want to, when your adjustment is done, you want to make sure you're down at the low spot and the wheel should turn and you should just hear it just rubbing. And you probably can't hear that, but right there it's dragging just a little bit. So that's just about right. So we're going to leave it at that. I'm going to go do the other side. So if you look right here, there's a grease zerk. This is for the rear axle bearing. It's a sealed bearing or a sealed space, so you're only supposed to put in one or two, just a couple of pumps. Um, I already did this side, and you can see one pump push grease out around the axle, and that's because, you know, these things were all fresh. But these are the, a lot of cars, these things never seem to get grease. I've pulled apart a, a few dry rear ends now. They go a long, long time without grease, but it's always better to do them. When I rebuilt this drive shaft, I put greasable U-joints in, so that's where this one greases. I don't think the factory ones had grease points, but I'd be surprised there's many cars running around on factory U-joints at this point. So I grease that. So you can see this front one. I don't know if you could ever really get to it. But when I had the transmission out, we re-greased it anyway. Because, uh, on this car, on the transmission, the uh, Drive shaft tunnel is actually a removable piece right up here in the front to get at it. That from a car with um, overdrive from the factory, that'd be a factory item, and I'm, this car I made my own. So, uh, so then these are the trunnions. That's the grease point there, but these do not get grease. They get 90 weight oil, and I'll show you that in a minute. There's also a grease zerk on the top which we'll get when we lower the car down. And I think that's all the grease points on this car. So this is a 
Pelicanemit, P-E-C-A-L-E-M-I-T, um, oiler. It can be used with grease or oil. I got this one from the Roadster factory, but I think, you know, Moss and Rimmers and all the rest, I think they all carry them. Um, you basically just unscrew the top, and you put some oil inside that cavity, which I will do. Hang on. So I don't put a super big load in here because it does tend to ooze out over time, and I only use this, you know, once a year or so. So you put some oil in. Uh, if you want to take the chance, you can try <laughs> Uh, pushing the uh, plunger back up to bring that up level, but it's a good chance you're just going to spill everything. And then you put the aluminum cap back. So once you've done that, you take it over to your uh, grease zerk, or oil zerk as the case may be here, and it's right there. I don't know if I can do this. I don't have enough hands. So you just push that, and it shoots oil into the trunnion. And you're supposed to do it until you can see oil come out of the top. And there it is, just dripping down the back edge. So that was about six strokes. And I'm going to go ahead and do the other side. But it's all... having the same problem that everybody has with front end components. The rubbers just deteriorate in no time at all. These were starting to split before I even finished the car. And I don't know what to say. I mean, these ball joints, I have managed on a lot of them that um, Dorman, a U.S. company, makes replacement boots that you can fit to these. My local Napa Auto Parts store has them in a variety of sizes. But these round rings for that, what you can do is buy them and take your chances. The TRF used to have the best rubber pieces because they contracted with uh, a company in Taiwan to make them exclusively for them. And I think they specced the, uh, the rubber and it was better rubber. Um, your mileage may vary. I forgot one of the things I forgot to do earlier was I just want to check the rear axle level, this is 90 weight gear lube, that's the plug right there, and that's the thing, and let's do that, and I'm going to need two hands, and let's put you down for a minute. So I've got the plug out, and it's just slowly dripping, I put the plug back in so it wouldn't leak out, but there was just enough, so that was drip, 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 and it wasn't just, you know, just fluid that it got splashed up there is actually full to that level, which is often the case. Now, well, just put that back in tight. If it was loose, you'd want to put rear axle lube in there. It's usually, I think, 85 weight or something. You want to make sure you use GL4 in all these trans in the axles and transmission. You want to use GL4 in the rear ends and the transmissions and the Triumphs in almost any older car because they're formulated for um, assemblies that use brass, like brass synchronizers, brass shims, brass shims, brass bushings. Uh, so GL5, which is what you know most everybody carries now, will attack brass. So you do not want to use that. You want to use GL4. I know that Napa Auto Parts usually has it on the shelf. Most of the other parts stores, if they don't have it, they can get it for you pretty quick. So just be aware of that. Amper ball joint, so I'm going to go ahead and put a few pumps in those. Same on both sides. Well, when I put the um, oil cooler on, you have to put this adapter on. This is where the canister type oil filter would normally go, which is actually trapped on this car because the steering column locks it in, you have to try to do everything down there. So, Anyway, so instead of um, trying to put a spin-on adapter down there, I put a remote oil filter in right here behind the alternator. Um, so you can see that's just down there. That This is the adapter for the oil cooler 
and that's the adapter for the remote oil filter which is here and you might think that this is incredibly messy but this type of filter which is a Fram PH3600 or I like to use Napa Gold filters this is a number 1516 these are made by Wix W-I-X they're really good filters so because it's got a they call it a valve but it's basically a rubber flap so that the oil doesn't drain back out of the oil filter when the motor shut off. It stops it from leaking a lot here. So let's just throw a couple of rags underneath in case there's a few drops. I mean, I typically put them on hand tight, but it's been on there for a couple of years now. So I just uh, loosen it up a little bit with this oil filter wrench and then just spin it off. So you can see that that's moving pretty easy now. Let me take that off. plug wire off, get it out of the way, and then we can just spin it off. And you can see there's a few drops of oil right around the base, but it's not very much. And that's it off. Clean off the base because it's just flat. Don't catch any dirt in there. And then we will uh, get a little bit of oil on our finger and loop the gasket. That's lubed. Back onto the plate. And because I'm wearing gloves and it's really oily, I'm just going to snug it up with the oil filter wrench. I also wanted to adjust the valve. So you take the valve cover off.
which will warp it, and then it'll never seal. So when you get it off, it's a good time to put it. You can take like a two-foot builder's level or a flat surface or something and put it down on there. See how flat it is, because you can straighten it back out again uh, with some gentle persuasion, small hammer sometimes, or whatever it takes. Don't forget to hook your vent back up, put your spark plug wire back on. Uh, so that's, that's it for adjusting the valves. So it's time to put the oil in. I've been putting a bottle of STP in ever since the feds required ZDDP be basically removed from conventional oils. At least anything is specified for a car with a catalytic converter, which is most of the, you know, 30 weight type of oils. I'm fortunate in that 2050 is not recommended for any new cars, so this still has ZDDP, though not as much as it used to. And it's getting hard to find, but I've been buying it from Walmart. That if you buy, they're about 19 or 20 dollars a bottle. If you buy 50 dollars worth of material, which is like two bottles and a couple of bottles of this, they will uh, free shipping. So that's what I've been doing. I buy four or five bottles at a time and put them in the garage. And you can see those have been sitting there while it's dusty. But it just makes life convenient. I can change the oil whenever I want. I keep an oil filter on hand too. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put those in. And while I'm doing, especially this is going to take a few minutes to drain the STP. I'm going to uh, check the other fluid levels, the brake and the clutch, uh, radiator, dash pots in the carburetor, etc. So I want to just take a general look around at things while you got it up. You notice this tire is wearing just a little bit more on the inside and the other tire is doing the same. So these are the uh, tire ends off the rack. I took these in a quarter turn. So I'm, you basically collapse that space a little bit, which will draw the two front tires together. My steering is nice and straight, so I just took an even amount on each turn, quarter turn on each side. And then while I got it up in the air, so I don't have to bend down, I'm going to check all the air on the tires. Uh, you should go by manufacturer's recommendations. If, like me, you got something that Triumph never designed to have on here, you got to kind of make it up as you go. But that's my experience. I'll do it what I think is right and, you know, how the tires are wearing. You know, they do seem to be wearing fairly squarely. So I don't think I'm off by much. So normally one of the other things we would have done was check the transmission level. Which is this plug right here. But I just filled this transmission up when I rebuilt it, you know, about 100 miles ago. So I don't really see any point. So you can see it's a little close to get at, but, you know, that wrench has got that offset, so it's all right. Uh, and again, whatever you think should be in there. I'm using Redline manual transmission lube in this, uh, and it's for all the cars with overdrive. Um, I really like it. It works well. Manufacturers do not recommend it. That they varied between requiring 85 or 80-90 gear lube and um, straight 30 weight motor oil. And that's because the, uh, the transmission manufacturer wants gear lube and the overdrive manufacturer wants hydraulic oil, essentially. And that's their compromise they came up with, 30 weight non-detergent motor oil. So, like I say, I've been using MTL, really happy with it. It's expensive, it's 50 bucks a gallon or so. But I've been very happy with it. I can tell you that in the TR7s, those transmissions that they actually Changed the recommendation to use an automatic transmission fluid in them uh, because of grinding issues going into gear. Well, I had a one TR7 had a ton of miles on it, and it would not go into second gear without grinding, no matter what you did. Hot, cold, medium, fast, slow, other than doing a perfect double clutch, you'd always get that little. <coughs> so we changed to uh, manual transmission loop and the problem went away. It's almost like I rebuilt the transmission. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was ready to pull the transmission out and do the whole thing on it, but I mean, it was still a little weak. I mean, you know, the car had, when we got rid of it, the car had 180,000 miles on it, and that transmission had not been rebuilt to my knowledge. 
we put 60,000 miles on it with the MTL in it and it worked fine. Uh, same thing, I used the uh, STP in the engine and we put 60,000 miles on that. It's a flat tap it cam. Uh, had a lot of miles on it and it still was fine. We sold the car a few years ago because we're trying to downsize a little bit. Still got 12. But um, like I say, it's really, if it's 50 bucks, it's expensive. It's about twice as much as uh, regular gear lube, but man, stuff really works good. And just the last thing, I just thought I'd show you this really gorgeous dash. Prestige Auto Wood in San Jose made that. It's Hawaiian Koa Wood, and we made it for full instrumentation, so it's a speedo attack, uh, fuel, oil pressure, volts, temperature, where the... Uh, Old Astro used to be. It's a nice CD player now. Those are the controls. Where, uh, the fan is for the radiator fan, and then the heater fan, wash, wipe, and all the standard controls, choke, and whatnot. But it's just freaking gorgeous. And this is the uh, I made these door panels out of uh, sheet stock from J.C. Whitney. The walnut caps came from Remember Brothers. They were overstock. Pretty inexpensive pair of uh, JC Whitney seat covers, which are okay. I've seen better. Uh, and then, of course, I made the back seat out of sheet material too. I had to weld the frame all back together because it was all rusted out. This car sat, I think, out in the desert, judging by how much sand was in it. So the roof was completely gone. The old wooden dashboard was just a couple of flakes of wood, literally. Uh, most of the gauges were trash. Of course, this car originally would have had just a cluster gauge of uh, speedometer with the idiot lights and a fuel gauge and then a temperature gauge on the side. Uh, and, you know, anything that was cloth or vinyl or anything else was just absolute trash. It, you could use a few of the pieces as patterns to, for this, to make pieces for the seats. That was about it. I also put uh, speakers into the quarters. You can see it down there. It's just kind of nice. And then there's another pair of... Uh, uh, box speakers. This is uh, the gap between the back of the seat and the back of the car right there. That's where the convertible top goes. So in the bottom there there's a couple of sort of square speakers so stereo sounds pretty nice. Electric antenna in it just for good looks. It's uh, obviously not a stock color paint. This is uh, this from Napa Auto Parts, a sleek color, but I just kind of like it. It's the uh, metallic it's blue, but it's got a little bit of cyan in it, so it's kind of got a purple hint in the sun. And then, of course, the dual exhaust. Pretty nice car. I really like it. It goes really well. You know, that motor, originally, the stock GT6 motor, it's, I don't know, 90 horse or so. So between the header, the improved carburation, bigger carburetors, better cam, it's blueprinted and balanced as well. I figure about 120 horse, so it's not crazy fast. But it's peppy. It's fun. Uh, of course, it's got the uh, T6 transmission in it, so it's uh, all synchro four-speed with the overdrive in third and fourth, so it's a six-speed transmission. So it, it goes along really well. So it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I can say this car sat for years. As near as I can figure, it, somebody must have bought it brand new, ran it, and then they had an accident. And I say that. Because when I got it, it looked square, but it had been repainted, and when I took it off, there was about an inch of Bondo in here. So it got hit in this area, and this is where the fuel tank is also. So instead of taking the fuel tank out and pushing it out, they just bondo the crap out of it and repainted it. And my guess is gave it to one of the teenagers, because somebody broke the bell housing in half, literally. You can see it's welded all the way around, so they must just like hold the revs, pop their foot off the clutch kind of thing. Because at 60 horse, it sure didn't have enough horsepower to break it just from hitting the gas. But somebody did a beautiful job welding it back together, i got to tell you. So when I got it, that's what saved it. They must have used it for the kid, and then the kid had it, and then, you know, whatever, wasn't fast enough, and parked it eventually. And it just, I got it from a guy down in L.A., and I think he got it from New Mexico. Um, it was originally dolphin gray, 
with a red interior. So it's probably pretty pretty. So I spent, well, it took me, I think, almost 10 years to restore it because I got started on it, um, did the body work, got it through paint, and then we uh, moved. We sold one house and bought the house we're in now. This house which is so much better. It's got this side lot with my lift. That's the house. Um, so I didn't do anything but work on houses pretty much and maintenance on cars for a number of years. But when I retired six years ago, I really set to work on that and got it done. So it's been on the road five years now. I've only put about 3,000 miles on it, but we have 10 vehicles that are on the road, insured, registered, you know, the whole nine yards. Uh, so I just don't drive any one of them very much. Uh, even, you know, the wife was using TR7s as commute vehicles, doing about 50 miles a day, which is why we had some TR7s with really high mileage. But me, I only worked, I don't know, seven miles from here, so I would just drive a different car every day, take about two weeks and cycle through all of them. Anyway, so don't forget to like and subscribe, and uh, we will see you on the next one.